worship is so beautiful, isn't yes. it? And you know, uh, God could care less. I don't want to insult the men, but God could care less about preaching because He is the living Word. You know? But He does love worship. He comes and inhabits the praises of His people. That is His time with you and your time with Him. And He is just uh, here in our praise and our worship. And, and um, one translation says we enthrone Him with our praise and worship. In other words, you make a seat for Him to come and sit in. Now I want to give Him a good seat, don't you? Oh, yeah. I want one of those seats that kick back and vibrate and song. <laughs> just say, God, you're the best. So God, you get the best. And the best I can give you is my love and worship. And you see, that's what he treasures the most. Amen? But we're going to get ready uh, for the uh, musicians to sing a song for us. And I'll turn it over to Sister Lena. Would you be seated, please? Because we hear a special song. I praise the, praise the Lord. God is good, God is good. and all the time. God, God is good. And this is a conference of breakthrough. And how many know one of the greatest breakthroughs you can do is choose God above all else? Yeah. Amen. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen.
like I told Larry yesterday, can we testify a little bit, you know? Yeah. Just testify. Uh, I like uh, writing down the belief, I call them uh, statements of believers. Uh, I'll just give you a couple here. Uh, God plus nothing equals everything. Yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> He's our everything. Uh, take it, the word of God, off the page. Act on it, you know? Just yeah. heard somebody talk about yeah. that. They were preaching and they went through that. Take it off the page. And then finally, uh, Jesus Christ is God who meets us where we are, not where we should be. You know, the should be is going to take place. But how about right now, you know? Right. Meeting God right now and we'll be... We'll deal with the, where we should be later, right? Yeah. We can deal with it right now, you know, but we just want it God of, God of right now. And I just like to testify, it was some brethren were talking to my wife about, you know, going to sleep at night. Before you go to sleep at night, start laughing, you know. And uh, I came in, you know, just driving in this morning, listening to some good worship music, Christian music, and, uh, and uh, I just started making myself laugh. And then... I was just laughing away. And, uh, you know, and I'm not trying to make light of all, you know, some of you are going through problems right now and stuff, but I was just laughing away and I was just saying, the victory really is in Jesus. Amen. The devil does not have a hold on my soul. Yeah, he's going to crop up. And yeah, thank you, Jesus, that I'm going to have another trial in another situation. You know, it's going to be hard, you know, like, uh, few months ago, see, I'm trying, trying to act on the Word of God. A few months ago, I got dehydrated, you know, and I just dumped in the toilet, you know, I was just heaving my guts out, you know, and I, and I finally stopped, and I, and I just, you know, as much as I could, thank you, Jesus, for this, you know. Now, what sense does that make, you know? I, I, I'm not thankful for throwing up, but I'm just thankful to Him for whatever situation I'm in, and there will be a breakthrough. And, you know, afterwards, and there was, you know, I was relieved of my body of whatever was happening in there, you know. And so, I was thinking even yesterday, we were singing a song about, about you know, and it's just another little testifying thing, you know, that, that God uh, saved me. I, I was knelt, knelt down, you know, I was working on my chopper motorcycle that I only rode for a couple months anyway. And, uh, and along came a lady and her husband. And, you know, I owed some money to my brother from a car. Anyway, the situation. And she just said, come here, honey. You know, I want to pray with you. So I held up one knee right there, you know, near the gutter of the street, you know, and asked Christ in my heart. And, you know, I've told the story before, but I'd just like to testify again. And they just watched them drive off. And I felt good. And things began to happen. And I got an accident and so forth, you know. And, and then I came to community chapel eventually and, and and, you know, we had a transformation in New Year's Eve service and then and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit going door to door, you know, with, with another lady in an in, in evangelism class, Bonnie Willis, remember her, uh, Mike, you know, and, and so, you know, got the Holy Spirit there and, you know, just thanking the Lord. And then five years ago, getting healed of cancer, you know, you know, just, just got healed. It was just so funny, you know, pastor called a two-day fast for me, I just... I couldn't believe it, you know, why me, you know, let's, let's fast for everybody and stuff, you know, but God, the gracious family of God came in, you know, and people were travailing, you know, I was travailing, and uh, so, you know, we just, we just want to believe God, and we want to just, you know, as we pray and call out, we know he's going to answer, you know, yeah. so look, looking for Charlotte's phone the other day, I just want to bring this out, it's not, it, it's all for Jesus, it's all exaltation of him, glory of him, but I was saying, Charlotte, you know, I, I like to pray for lost things, you know, do something, it's just, it's just a little simple thing, you know, fun thing to do, you know, but God, where is that, you know, and we'll cause it to show up. He may not let it show up for a minute, you know, or right away, it may take a little time, just wait on God, you know, and so we found her phone, you know, I found it right in the, in the rack, you know, in the book rack, but just, I just want to emphasize, encourage you, you know, whatever, you know, from the, from the smallest to the most serious thing in our lives, we focus on our God, you know, we're singing it today. He is our God, you know, and he's the victory. And I think, I think we just, we need, really need to laugh about it and be, and be victorious, right? In the midst of all this, I am so sad. Yeah. I am so, uh, you know, I'm so sad, yet I know God works out all things, you know, but I'm so sad for the faithful servants of God that couldn't make it in the house of God this week, you know, because of sickness. 
but God is right there with them and there is a breakthrough happening and a healing going to take place and so hallelujah I don't know if I can emphasize it more you know we, we, we got that victory in Jesus so uh, <laughs> let's laugh right? let's laugh it's just you know we just you just the, Jesus he put you know the foot is on the neck of the devil he did it all at the cross resurrected you know and I want to share it again also just to finish up <clears throat> I talked about it but I want to say it again my, my wife she's had some real spiritual dreams and I've had a couple myself I've actually seen Jesus and but uh, she had a dream of my sister and maybe a handful of people that remember her Kathy she came here for a little while and then she went up north to a special home she's born with retardation <clears throat> cerebral palsy and then through my family uh, uh, junk that went on in, in, in my childhood you know all the yelling and alcoholism and so forth and her my mom would drag her out of the out of the house when all sorts of yelling started taking place between her and my dad and uh, she just got schizophrenic you know later on and stuff so I prayed with her you know a little prayer a sinner's prayer you know before she she went to be with the Lord she couldn't talk well you couldn't understand her and all of a sudden you know dear Jesus come into my heart and you know she just per perfect English you know so my wife has a dream of, you know the other day of her and, and, and they're meeting up in heaven and Kathy is just whole and Debbie's just you know, I mean, we believe this, you know, but just to have a little uh, a thing like this happen, and, and she has this dream, and like, I, I, you know, Ka Kathy, my sister, says, yeah, I had it hard down there, you know, but but she was just totally whole, speaking perfect, and she almost said, gosh, she's speaking like a psychologist or something, you know, she knows everything and stuff, but God is good, he's so great, you know, and you like, like to just, we need to testify, you know, we need to testify to Jesus, about Jesus, and, and to, you know, when we go out, when we trek out, wherever our feet are, we are a missionary for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I really appreciate the, the glories, you know, and they're in their Uber thing, and they're just they're just talking to people about God, you know, and just the, the time is set up for them. You know, and, and so we we people need the Lord. We need to we need to tell them that we need to just worship God in all our pathways. So. Anyway, let's all get up and come around and worship the Lord in our giving. Thank you, Lord
outer edges of the earth, Lord, where people are persecuted, and they're, and they're actually testifying that the joy of the Lord is my strength, and they're counting it worthy to suffer for their Lord Jesus, for our Lord Jesus. Thank you for this you brought, that's brought in by your people, God. And we pray again, Lord, for our brethren in the house of God here that can, cannot make it, that would be here in the drop of a hat. Lord, we pray for your touch upon them and your strengthening and the joy of the Lord through every situation, God. And all of us here, Lord, we count the victory in you as just so high. You're so exalted. It's all about you, Jesus. And we want the relationship with you. We want the breaker to just, just so in, envelope our life and, and, and be enclosed in our walk with, with him. The holy breaker of God that just breaks forth and, and opens up the windows of heaven, Lord God, that people may know the Lord. That what we have, we can give so out of compassion because of what the Lord Jesus has done, what, how he's gone, come up upon our life and how he flows through us still. Thank you, Lord, for your touch and your Holy Spirit upon everybody today. Amen. And the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'm going to give you the opportunity to shake hands and uh, say hi to different ones, honor the spaces of those that don't want to shake your hand. They, you know, they don't think they have leprosy, but uh, the thing is, uh, if they don't want to shake hands, you don't have to. You can just wave your hand and just say, I'm glad you're here with us today and to worship and magnify the Lord. We have the musicians and singers play and sing as we get ready for the platform ministry. God bless you. God himself is the breaker. And uh, 
and then how that it is the anointing, the Spirit of God, that is identified also as the breaker, one that breaks or destroys the yoke. And in this new covenant provision that we have, the breaker abides within. And because the breaker abides within, there is a quality of life and a quality of victory that is afforded us as new covenant believers. But when you think of the word breakthrough, oftentimes we identify the, the act of God's strength or the act of God's ability to break us out of confinement and uh, deal with the obstacles and, and break us forth into a new place. But you know, behind the act, we need to see the heart, the heart of God. The heart of God, and the reason that God is a God of breakthrough, is because God's heart toward his children is that you and I would not live confined in an area. That God wants every one of us. And aren't you glad that when we talk about spiritual breakthrough, it's not reserved for a, a select few. It's not reserved for those who are more spiritual. It's not reserved for those who have a particular calling. But the very idea of breakthrough, the very idea of that kind of experience in God is reserved for all of God's children. And it's the heart of God. We've got to capture the heart of God that causes him to show up as the Lord of the breakthrough in our life and that he wants us to experience all that Christ has afforded us. And so this morning I just pray that uh, we would consider more deeply God's heart. And as a result of God's heart, we would be postured in expectation to believe God for the necessary breakthroughs. Maybe within, you're here within the sound of my voice and you could quickly identify areas where you know you need a breakthrough, whether it's internal, whether it's external. And so I want to submit to you in a, our time together I want to identify some things that would help us. I'm going to call this the pathway to breakthrough. The pathway to breakthrough. Now let me say something concerning anything in God. There's no magic verse. There's, there's no magic bullet, so to speak, that says, oh, if, if, if I could have just known that, that's going to be, you know, that's, that's the key. Uh, I have found that everything in God is simple, but requires His power for us to do it. God comes in the form of simplicity. In fact, Paul expressed his concern to the Corinthians, and he said, I pray that you would not be removed from the simplicity that is in Christ. The truth that God gives us, he, he hides from the wise. He hides from the prudent. And he reveals them to the simple. And he wants us to simply believe. To simply take him at his word. If there's any key to seeing God unlocked in your life in any area, it is to simply take him at his word. And to make the appropriate changes by his power and by his enabling grace so that that word is not just information you agree with, but it becomes literally the path that you begin to walk upon. And that's good news. That's good news. We serve a God of promises and a God of principles. And the Bible warns us in Hebrew that we could actually come short of God's promise. You can come short of a breakthrough. You can come short of any promise left us. And many times we just zero in on God's promises. Uh, we even have a Bible pocket promise book. We become well acquainted with the promises and because we know his promises we think automatically those promises are going to become our experience. That's not necessarily so. We can come short of the promises and we're exhorted 
in the book of Hebrews that we do not come short of the promises the way Israel did. I mean, they came. I mean, they're the primary example. But there are many other examples when God had something in store for his people, something in store for someone, and they came short. And to think that that can't happen with us, we would be sadly mistaken. And the reason why they would come short of the promise is not because God's not faithful to his word. Oh no, God is able to fulfill all of his promises. But it's because oftentimes they celebrated the promise but refused to walk in his principles. Or they refused to walk in his ways. David's cry was, show me thy ways, O God, and teach me thy paths. That's why I'm calling this the pathway to breakthrough. There are pathways in God in order to experience the promises of God, and we cannot discount those pathways. The pathway, in fact, the promise of God oftentimes will be uh, simply a result of walking on that pathway. It'll become an experience that in the due course of time, will visit your life. And I dare say that the real battle is going to be staying on the pathway, right. not deviating. Because there's always going to be battles. There's going to be temptations. The enemy will do everything he can to cause you to deviate, get off God's path. And so that's really what's so significant and so important. Early this morning I was meditating in the Psalms and I just captured the heart of God for Israel and God's cry. I mean it was it was a divine lamentation. If you could capture the the heart of God, the profound sorrow that he had for a people that did not come in to what he had promised. And he said in Psalm 8, verse 10, Oh, that my people, verse, I'm sorry, verse 13, Oh, that my people had hearkened to me, and oh, that Israel had walked in my ways. You could almost hear the lament. It's a lament from God. Oh, oh, that they had just walked in my ways. They sang of the promised land. They knew the promise. They saw the, the fruit of the promised land. There's no question as to promises that had their name on it, but all oh, that they had walked in my ways. All oh, that they would have hearkened to me. And I love what it goes on to say. I should soon have subdued their enemies. You talk about breakthrough. I would have turned my hand against their adversaries. I would have been the breaker. He goes on to say, I would have fed them with the finest of the wheat, with the honey out of the rock. I would have satisfied them. And you capture the heart of God, and that's God's heart toward his people. And so God just doesn't give promises. He provides pathways, and it's up to us to search out and submit to the paths of the Lord revealed in his word, whispered in our spirit. When we hear his ring a word to our hearts and he gives direction, behind that is the intent and the desire that he will fill you with the finest of wheat in the kingdom. That you would enjoy honey out of the rock, honey out of the hard place. That there would be a provision of the Lord for your victory, even though you're in a hard place. That he would subdue your enemies. That he would show up as the breaker. And you capture the heart of God behind his desire to see his people come into all that his son died for us to experience. It's the heart of every father. Israel, like many Christians, there was a great period of time in the book of Judges where there was the cycle of the Judges, where they would experience 
breakthrough, and then they would go back to worshiping idols and they would become ensnared again, needing another breakthrough. And God would raise up another judge and they'd get another breakthrough. And then the judge would die and then they would go back. They would be ensnared by the idolatry of the nations around them. They would be ensnared by the images that they were told to destroy and they didn't. And as a result, they found themselves in need of another breakthrough. It was almost like going nowhere fast. Five steps forward, five steps back. Five steps forward, five steps back. It's the cycle of the judges. And we see that cycle in Israel. And these things were written for our instruction. And you could, in your walk with God, similarly, you can find yourself always needing God to rescue you. And then God comes out of his goodness and God does something so significant in your life and there's freedom and the tears flow and you worship God and you thank God. But then what happens is you find yourself in the same situation time and time again. I'm here to tell you God has something better prepared for you. Because when we really talk about breakthrough, other than certain circumstances, it's not limited to that. The greatest breakthroughs are the internal ones, and they have to do with our progress in the Lord. They have to do with us growing up in the Lord. It has to do with us developing in the Lord. And there will be adverse circumstances, there'll be situations, and it's actually all part of our training. But it's those breakthroughs. But God does it want you to, he doesn't want your walk with him to be characterized by that kind of cycle. He wants you to progress. He wants to break through as God breaking in, breaking down, and then you breaking forth into new territory, new spiritual territory. But you know, before we talk about the pathway of breakthrough, one of the things we need to consider when we go to our text, supporting the theme, which is David and Belperazim. And we read about the victory that he got over the Philistines. And he named the place Belperazim, which means the God of the breakthrough. And I said last night, it's almost like a dual meeting. Because it was the God of breakthrough, David became the possessor of the breakthrough. And God wants you to possess the breakthroughs you need in your life. But it also says... In that same verse, and there, someone say there. Yeah. There meaning the place of breakthrough, the place where he found entrance and the breaker showed up, overcoming the enemies. David was, was able then to, and Israel was able to come into a greater place. It says there, in the place of breakthrough, it says that, the enemies left their images. They were overcome, but the images were left behind. And it said, and David burned them there. Don't overlook that. Every word of God is with particular purpose and meaning. And so, lest we just celebrate the breakthrough, why would David burn those images? To keep Israel and himself from that cycle. Because even though they did experience a marvelous breakthrough, he knew, according to God's word, those images would become a snare to the people. If the images were left in their life, in their settlement of where the enemy once occupied, and you don't deal with the images, eventually it will get into your experience. And before you know it, idolatry enters in. And even though God gave the breakthrough, those images, come on, they become, they become an impairment for you to fully experience the fruit of the breakthrough. So I suggest to you and me that while the breakthrough suggests an event, and it does, we need to steward the breakthrough. 
We have a responsibility for everything God does in our life. We have a responsibility to make the appropriate changes inside of our lives, in our thinking. I mean, we shared along this week how that Gideon experienced a breakthrough. He was bound to the natural identity of his family being impoverished and he being the least in his house. And as long as that ruled and the, those images which dictated his identity, he could never qualify to do what God wanted him to do. He would have never risen up. He would have never began to act out uh, what God wanted him to act out. So it was very important that he would break forth from that and begin to believe what the angel declared concerning who he was. And so he had to break forth from that. And so it's so very important for you and me that when God provides a breakthrough, that we've got to steward the new territory. And one of the ways you steward the new territory is casting down the images and the identities of yesterday. And that you would fully embrace what God said about your life. The promise that God has made your life. The very thing you believe, God, that, that puts you in a position, a faith position. To believe God for the breakthrough. Get rid of the images. Yes. Because it will bring you back into a vicious cycle. And you can become ensnared again. So I believe that while a breakthrough is exciting, a breakthrough, I mean, we love to testify about the breakthrough. It's very important then that we correspond to that breakthrough by taking appropriate action so we can steward the new place in God. And it's going to involve change of thinking. It's going to involve change of action in the new place. Right. You know, when Israel was brought into the promised land and they saw the fruit of it, how many know there were still cities they needed breakthroughs? The first city was a walled city and it was straightly shut up. They needed to see the breaker come in. So it wasn't a land without adversity. In fact, they were to inherit it as they experienced breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough. And there was a specific set of instructions they had to seek God as to how to deal with every city. But beyond the city walls, what was waiting for them was a new experience. It was wealth and prosperity, or as we read in the Psalms, fine flour and honey from the rock and you know, all of the wealth of the abundant life, which is what it speaks to us concerning in Christ. I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. That you and I would experience not necessary or limited to the natural things, but the riches of the soul and the riches of a walk with God. So that even if I find myself in a lean time circumstantially, I am wealthy and I am rich. I still can have peace that money cannot buy. I still can have a joy that my circumstance doesn't dictate. Come on. And so it's, it's the wealth. There is a prosperity. There is certainly the promise of God's provision. And we are going to have to learn in these days as you and I find ourselves living in the hour that we're living in, in this country these days, we're going to have to really dig our heels in God's faithful covenant. We're going to really have to do that. We're going to have to stand and believe. We're going to be put to the test more so. But I'm here to tell you that God's test worthy and His word is faithful. Can you say amen? Yes. So David burned those images. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. Let me just read this to you. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach and patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. It actually means those who live in opposition to their goals. You can actually be living in opposition to your desired outcome. In other words, your actions 
are not providing for you the pathway that will lead you to the breakthrough so you can come into a richer place in God, in your relationship with God, a greater place in the Spirit, a greater place within your calling, an increase of the flow of God in your life. That, that's what I zero in on the breakthrough. But you know what? The breakthrough doesn't uh, begin and end with us. I do believe that it is for us as believers, but God also wants the church to see itself as the ecclesia, that together we are a breakthrough community. And I believe one of the things that God is doing today is that he is restoring the understanding of the apostolic nature, power, structure, and foundation of the church more than anything else. First and foremost, the church is apostolic and prophetic. That's the foundation upon which it was established. And when you understand the nature of the call of the apostle, apostolos, you realize that the very characteristic of an apostolic calling is breakthrough. It's breaking into foreign territory and extending the expression of the throne that they represent. That's where the word came from. And so we need an awakening today as the church that we are established territorially, sovereignly planted, that God wants the, me to experience the kinds of breakthroughs that give my life a quality that he can move through so that together with the community of people that we're joined with, there can be a spirit of breakthrough in the church, but it doesn't even end. I'm not talking about a good church service. That there is a recognition that as Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And we need an awakening of the sending nature of God's call upon the church more than anything else. We've seen it primarily as a care center. It has been primarily pastoral majoring on the cares of the individual. And that's necessary. But the primary calling is that the church advance. That's what Jesus said. Is that there's an advanced nature to the church. You see, if you get a breakthrough, and if the church has a vision of breakthrough, and we discover the pathways that lead to breakthrough and don't settle for anything else, then a spirit of breakthrough can go forth from the house into the territory. You know, I think about when Philip in Acts chapter 8, when Philip went to Samaria, Saul was consenting to the death of Stephen. A great persecution came against the church. There was a great scattering of the church, and they preached everywhere. And then it picks up with Philip going down to Samaria. And what did he do? Philip went down to Samaria, and he preached the kingdom of God. He healed the sick. And the power of God was manifesting in that area, in that city. But the Bible says that there was a stronghold. There was a territorial stronghold that was literally manifesting through a sorcerer. That all the people in the city regarded him as some great power. And they literally, the whole city was bewitched under that power. So as long as that power, that principality, ruled in that territory, the people were terribly bound. So what does God do? He sends somebody with a breaker anointing. He sends somebody preaching the word. He sends somebody manifesting a greater power. And as a result, the Bible says, there was such a breakout in the territory, the whole city was filled with joy. The climate of the city changed because we have one man that came into a city realizing and understanding the apostolic sending that was upon his life, the nature of the commission and the call to go out into all the world, and as a result, we see Simon is overwhelmed by a greater power, and he's asking the apostles, can I get your power? 
And I really believe that. We need a breakthrough in our nation. We need a breakthrough in our cities. And the reason God has planted his people in territories is so that through our lives we can become conduits to see breakthroughs in areas. So that the power of the kingdom of God, this should really occupy our intercession and our prayer. That his rule, his power would come in our area, our families, our sphere of influence. Yes. And the Lord, I believe, wants to awaken us to the dimension of that apostolic commission first and foremost. Can you say amen? amen. And so we're reading 2 Timothy. It says that those who live in opposition to themselves, if God by chance will give them a change of mind, which is repentance, to the acknowledging of truth. Because if God will grant them understanding of the truth, they'll be able to get off the wrong path. If they can get off the wrong path, they'll be able to come into the goal of their life. It will not be like them reaching for confetti, you know, in a march wind, just always out of their grasp. They actually live in opposition to themselves. That's why the cry of David is, Lord, teach me your ways. Because as believers, we can believe right, we can believe the promises there, but we're on the wrong path. We're doing the wrong things. We've, we've continued with practices in our life, maybe not necessarily evil or not... Or, or not engage in the kinds of practices that will militate against your natural man. It'll seem so foolish. Stan said he got up this morning and the Lord said, laugh. Now, how I many know oh, that sounds ridiculous? Come on. Laugh. And he did. Thank God he obeyed God. Because it provided for him a path of joy. Yeah. It provided for him a path. I mean, that man stood behind this pulpit and he's just carrying another atmosphere. And I'm sure there was probably more reasons for him to get up and to, oh, you know. But the things of the spirit are foolishness to the natural man. Yeah. And for the most part, we're going to have to learn God's ways God grant us the power to repent of continuing on the path of our ways so we no longer live in opposition to our own selves and we can come into the breakthrough. It goes on to say that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. I don't want that in my life. I don't want him to be able to yank my chain whenever he wants and keep me back. No, no, I don't want that. It actually indicates in this verse that for the most part, let, let me say it this way. You have the keys to your own breakthrough. You have the keys to your own breakthrough. Yes. Yeah. And so many times people think that we need, you know, something, and that's when we come under the victim's mentality. I, I, I need a different situation. I need somebody from outside. I need, but for the most part, there are keys. And it's called the key of knowledge. And Jesus rebuked those Pharisees. He said, you have removed the key of knowledge. How many know knowledge is a key that opens doors? If you don't have knowledge of God's will, you cannot have faith to lay hold of it. Faith requires an unveiling, a revealing of something God has in store. He said, you have removed the key of knowledge. How did they do that? Because you teach for doctrine the traditions of men. 
And you make the word of God of none effect. And as a result of that, you keep the door of the kingdom shut, locked by the people, in front of the people. They are unable to enter in because you took the key out. And neither will you enter in. But I believe that there are keys to the kingdom. And there are keys according to God's word so that there can be an unlocking, a breakthrough for God's work to do something in your life that will break you forth into a new place. And you no longer have to live in opposition to yourself. Can you say amen? amen? It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down a stronghold, casting down the imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the true and accurate knowledge of God. Bringing into captivity every thought, like David, he burned all those images to the obedience of Christ. It says in verse 6, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. The word revenge there means to retaliate and to thoroughly punish. To thoroughly punish. And here's what Paul is saying. That we've got to cast down these foreign thoughts that provide wrong pathways for us to walk on wrong imaginations that dictate how we walk and you need to thoroughly punish them you need to execute them you say well how do i execute it it becomes executed you will revenge the disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled that's why obedience to God's word and obedience to the word of the Lord, to the instruction of God is so key. When by the grace of God, I get on the pathway of obedience, I am actually dealing a death blow, a vengeance to what was holding me captive. There is nothing that can replace obedience. Obedience is really the key that brings the breakthrough. Can you say amen? So it's not good enough to know at some point you've got to say, Lord, I need a change of mind yes. so that I will fully embrace your path. Yes. I will embrace your way. And when you get and start walking according to God's way, when you start on God's path, you will then be actively destroying a path, an old path, that was leading you and keeping you in bondage. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yes. Yeah, it's, it won't be destroyed by the laying on of hands. It won't be destroyed by somebody destroying your old actions. You have to destroy it. You've got to issue a revenge, a vengeance toward it. How? When your obedience is fulfilled. And that's when the activation of faith, that's when faith is active through obedience. Faith without works is dead. But faith and everything that we gain in God is through faith. Amen. Everything we gain in God is through faith. But faith, faith is not it's an active ingredient of the kingdom, but it doesn't become activated until it is expressed in obedience. And that's why the enemy will fight you tooth and nail on making the actual changes to walk on a different path. The moment you do that, you activate faith. Faith comes from God, but faith could be dead if there's no corresponding action to obedience. Faith being alone, James said, is dead. It's like a corpse without breath. Faith comes from God, but he doesn't just give you faith to give you a thrill, to give you a feeling, to feel a surge. He gives you faith to give you the ability to get on the path. Follow his ways. And when you do, you then are dealing a death blow to the old path, and you'll be on a path that will lead to breakthrough. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's just consider the pathway that leads to breakthrough. And I want to 
consider something here that we have in James. James chapter 5 and verse 16. He said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. How many know the effectual prayer of a righteous man brings breakthrough? Sure it does. And then immediately he said, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we. He went through the same struggles as we are. He lived with no halo. He went through the very same temptations. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months, but he prayed again. Someone say, he prayed again. Amen. And the heavens gave rain, and the earth poured forth her fruit. How many would agree that that was a pretty great breakthrough? Yeah. Oh, you talk about a breakthrough. That was a breakthrough. And the whole nation became a beneficiary of one man's breakthrough. That's why your breakthrough is challenged so much. Because it's not just about you. It's about its positive impact on other people. Your breakthrough will inspire other people. And it will inspire them for their breakthrough. I shared the example about Chuck Yeager and how that when he challenged the invisible barrier, the speed of sound with his craft, he released a sonic boom. Didn't know what was going to happen, but a new sound was released in the earth. And every pilot that was below heard the explosion. And that sound was a sound of invitation that one man broke through, and if one man broke through, another man can break through. Yes. And another man can break through. And now they're going two, three, four times the speed of sound, but it took somebody that would press all the way for the breakthrough. It changed the whole industry. It changed the whole possibility of air travel. It was all hinged upon a man's breakthrough, affected the military, affected war, fighter planes. What could be designed because of one man's breakthrough and his willingness to go forward when everything tempted him to pull back like all the other pilots. But thank God for those that get the breakthrough because it becomes an invitation for others. That's why your testimony is so important. Testimony services. You know, I'll never forget, we saw a wonderful move of God on Long Island in the 70s. The charismatic movement, churches, full gospel churches were, I think in a matter of just a few years, there was over 25 or 30 full gospel churches that seemed to just grow up overnight. Many, many people coming out of dead religion. The services were characterized by the power of God, not just in one place, but in many, many places. And I remember being a part of that. And the real key to the spread of that revival, it was, it was not just limited to the preaching, and it wasn't limited to what was taking place in service. After service, people would pile into restaurants or pile into homes. It was the testimonies, the testimonies how they got filled with the Holy Spirit, so and so got saved. And those testimonies of God working extraordinarily in a way of providing breakthroughs in different lives just was causing the revival fire to spread. Come on. Amen. It was encouraging the faith of other people to believe God, the testimonies of what happened to their friends and what happened to just ordinary people that you know, God was moving in their lives. That did more to spread the spirit of revival. That did more to spread the move of God than perhaps anything else. And so the testimony of your breakthrough is so important because it will inspire other people. But we have here, when James talks to us about prayer, he is literally presenting to us an example of breakthrough prayer. He reaches back and he says, Elijah. Now, Elijah, he goes right to the occasion on Mount Carmel. That was a breakthrough. I mean, come on, the Old Testament is a record of a world of prayer. But James indicating to us 
How that the prayers of righteous people could provide breakthroughs. They could accomplish much. Behold Elijah. Man, you're going to take me to Elijah? As an example? And when I learned, I gained an understanding of a path that Elijah walked on in order to get the breakthrough. After his confrontation with the false prophets at Carmel, he then went and he prayed. After the fire came upon the restored altar, he said that, tell Ahab, there is a sound of an abundance of rain. What is the key to breakthrough? That Elijah, then he threw himself on the ground with his head between his knees and he became prayerfully focused just upon the prophetic sound. Nothing in the natural encouraged him that the famine would be over. There was not a cloud in the sky. You know the story. Seven times he sent his servant. What do you see? Nothing, nothing, nothing. And don't you know, he was a man of like passion. He knew the pressure. He had the felt pressure. The breakthrough didn't come the moment he started praying. Breakthrough never comes. There's always a time period. And that's where the war is. And so he had to make a decision. Do I nurture and I allow the sound I have on the inside of me to dictate my intercession even though in the natural there's not a cloud in the sky even though there's no indication that there'll be any kind of change there is no indication that a breakthrough is near at hand but Elijah refused to give up on the sound and that's the example that James gives us. And I think James really is giving us a path. He's showing us a path of how prayer, breakthrough prayer, comes about. And it comes about when you refuse to be moved from the sound of the promise that God revealed to your heart. Amen. The sound of the prophetic word, the sound of the quickened word. The sound of what God has revealed. There comes a point in time when there must come. No, if you're going to be positioned, if you're going to be positioned to be a vessel of breakthrough, there must come a determination that I will not capitulate. There's no other option but to pray through the sound. Pray through the sound. That's a path a breakthrough prayer. Every revival is born out of that pathway, out of that principle. I mean, we read about the breakthrough. We read about the fruit. We read about the lives changed. We read about, you know, all that is impacted. It's the breakthrough that gets the headlines. But behind the breakthrough, somebody or a group of people like Elijah stayed in a position because they were convinced that a breakthrough was coming for a better day. Yeah. I think about the late 1940s and the Hebrides revival. And two sisters, Peggy and Christine Smith, both in their 80s, one body racked with arthritis and the other sister blind could no longer make the church services. But they were convinced that God wanted to bring a fresh visit visitation to the Isle of Lewis in the Hebrides. And so every day, these eight-year-old sisters gave themselves to unremitting prayer like the spirit of Elijah and began to cry out to God for the, for the abundance of rain for a spiritual outpouring. And God rocked those islands with a great revival. Amen. You know what's so wonderful? Isn't that something? You can have a body racked with arthritis and blind and you become the catalyst and the component that can literally bring a breakthrough that can change lives in an area. Yes. But when you read that account, it's so inspirational because as they prayed, 
God then would give them words and he would quicken his word, continuing to reassure their hearts, stay in prayer. This is what God wants to do. And then they would begin in prayer, they would begin to speak the word of the Lord. And as a result, an outpouring. As a result, a breakthrough. There comes a point in time when you've got to take the sound of God's promise for your life. And it's not up for negotiation. Amen. It's not up for negotiation. Yeah, but, no, that yeah, but will kill you. Amen. Come on. That yeah, but will keep you from the seventh dip by Naaman. Amen. Come on. You may have dipped six times, but the seventh dip brought, brought the breakthrough. But how many know you needed six uneventful dips in order to get the breakthrough of the seventh dip? Come on. Can you say amen? amen. It's like the children of Israel around Jericho. They had a walk. I don't know what was took more faith. To shout on the seventh day or to keep quiet for six days. <laughs> and I think there's a reason God said, okay, six days, shut your mouth. Because they go, oh, is he crippling? And they're looking at the walls because God knew they would have relinquished the breakthrough the more they would have talked looking at the great walls around the city. So he said, the key to your breakthrough is don't say a word. And for six days, they were silent. I think it took more faith to remain silent, not complain, question. This is crazy. Joshua said, we're going to go around again and again. What is he crazy? Nothing is happening. But God said, you be quiet. You be quiet. Don't you begin to reason. Don't you begin to talk about the very things that will dissuade you from the position of breakthrough. But continue to water the sound in your spirit with intercession, like Elijah. And that's what, they, that's what James said. For the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man brings a breakthrough. Amen. Hallelujah. And a whole nation benefited from the man who gave himself to the breakthrough. So I believe a path is prayer, praying the sound. Praying the sound. Come on, take what's quickened, nurture the prayer, let it become the very centerpiece of your prayer. No, that's a pathway, and it's going to take faith, and it's going to take the power of God, but it's going to take focus. Let me tell you what another one. I'll give you this aspect too that's part of a pathway. Worship. Amen. Worship. We have the story of Jehoshaphat. And when you read the story of Jehoshaphat, again, he needed a breakthrough. Surrounded by the enemy. And as they set themselves to seek the Lord, a son of Asaph, the Spirit of God came upon him and the prophetic word was released. The word of the Lord came. No change. But the word of the Lord was, you don't need to fight in this battle. Amen. For the battle is not yours, it is the Lord's. Really? God released his word. And when the word of the Lord came, no change, still surrounded by the enemy, the Bible says they worshipped when they heard the word. And then he went on and appointed singers. Now come on. You don't appoint singers until the battle's over. <laughs> Come on, you, you, you don't stir up the choir until the victory has been gained. But that demonstrated, he said, believe the Lord God, you'll be established, believe his prophets, and you will prosper. And so what he was saying is we're going to put corresponding action, demonstrating we believe the word of the Lord. We're still surrounded by the enemy. There's been no indication of let up. There's no indication of breakthrough. But come on, we're going to strike up the choir. We're going to begin to, you know, play the instruments. And we're going to appoint singers and worshipers as though we've got the victory. Demonstrating that we believe what God said. That's a pathway. Yes. Worship. Yes. And when they worship, it says as they worship, the breaker came in. Now, we don't worship for a breakthrough. We worship God because he's worthy. Amen. But it's the nature of God. He said, you worship me and I'll work. Amen. 
And God sent derision. And you know the story. And as a result, there was a great victory. But beyond the breakthrough, Je Jehoshaphat could have never imagined all the spoil, all the blessing in the Valley of Barakah. There was a new sphere of provision. There was a sphere of plenty beyond the battle, beyond the breakthrough. That there was so much they couldn't even carry it all away. But that's a path, the pathway of worship, the pathway of praise. And we see that that path is carried over into the New Testament. There's Paul, Acts chapter 16, preaching the gospel. Macedonia, Philippi, delivers a young girl who has a spirit of divination. As a result, the authorities come, lay many stripes upon him and Silas, throw him into prison. Now, how many know he had a decision to make? Will he come under the power of the circumstance? But you see, what they didn't realize is this. Though temporarily, he would be a prisoner of the magistrates, he was the Lord's free man. He refused to allow an incarceration and a binding of his spirit. So about midnight, what does he do? He does what Jehoshaphat did. He and Silas pray and they sing praises to the Lord. And as they worship God, the breaker shows up. And a breakthrough comes. And again, not just for them. All the prisoners become the recipient of their breakthrough. Yes. And then the prison guard. He sees all the prisoners are open. All the prison doors are open. He wants to kill himself. Paul said, don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. He sees the display of such a breakthrough. The disposition of Paul and Silas. Oh my God, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus. And you'll be saved and your household. Next thing you know, he takes Paul and Silas in. He tells his authorities, leave these men alone. Brings them into his house. They get baptized. That brings them into his house. And starts washing their wounds. He probably was one of the ones that gave those wounds. Starts washing the wounds sets out a feast on the table and they're eating at his table. You talk about a breakthrough. You talk about a change of events. Where does it come from? It came from two men that said, we're going to get on God's pathway. I don't care what the circumstance is. We're going to worship and we're going to pray because God is the same. Come on, can you say amen? And we're going to lift up his name. Don't you let anything or anyone steal your soul. Yes. Sometimes the greatest act of faith is being able to worship Him when your world is falling apart. Yes. But that's the very key that will unlock a breakthrough that will come into your spirit, into your life. Come on, can you say that? Yes. Very, very, very important. And so later on, this became part of Paul's experience now. So what is he going to write to the church at Philippi? Later on, when he's in prison, he'll never forget the breakthrough he experienced. So he's going to write to them, rejoice in the Lord always. And in case you didn't get the first point, again, I say rejoice. Because he discovered in their backyard that there's a breaker and there's a God that brings breakthrough when you rejoice in the Lord and when you praise him. So right into that church, he said, keep on rejoicing. In the face of persecution, rejoice. In the face of opposition, sing your song. Keep worshiping. Keep praising God. It's a pathway to breakthrough. Hallelujah. You don't have to figure out your breakthrough. No, really. 
Again, I said these are these are simple. These are simple truths. It's it's no heavy revy here. You know what I mean? But we try to figure out how how God how's He going to do that with our little pea brain, and we get into you know stinking thinking and figuring out. And before you know, we're not praying and we're not singing and we're not worshiping and we're going down and down and down. I don't know how He's going to do it. That's not my business. My business is to worship Him. Yeah. And my business, come on. My business is to keep on praying. If He said it, He will do it. I don't know how He's going to do it. But He's not a man that He should love. He is ever mindful of His covenant. He is faithful and predicated upon that aspect of His nature and the immutability of His word. I'm going to keep on praying. You see, these are the paths that we really need to embrace if we're going to really be and live in a breakthrough spirit. It doesn't just come to the haphazard. It doesn't just, you know, come to your life and just hope God, I know God can, I know God, no, no, no. No, no, get on the path. There is a path that leads to breakthrough. There is a path yeah. Get on that path. And if you'll get on that path, you may not know when. You certainly won't know how. But God will be faithful yes. to do what he said he <laughs> would do. Can you say amen? amen? Stand with me to your feet. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask you just throw your hands up right now. Especially those of you that are mindful of the breakthrough you're, you have need of. Is there anybody here that can think of a specific area you really need, see, you need to see God undertake? Okay. You need to see the breaker come in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you that the concern of that, may God grant you grace to lay it down. And may he grant you grace to lift up those hands and begin to worship him as though you've already possessed that breakthrough. Because you believe his word is more true than your experience. Come on, that's a, that's a faith that overcomes the world. That's a faith not of this world. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the assurance. The assurance of things not yet see throw those hands up we worship you lord we give you praise i wonder if you could just release a song in your heart can you make melody in your heart go ahead and release your song worship him hallelujah we worship you lord we give you glory and we give you honor you are faithful ascribe greatness unto god for he is great and greatly to be praised Go ahead and declare his goodness. Declare his faithfulness. Declare that he is your father. Declare that his eye is upon you. Declare that his arm, his hand is 
hundreds of young people getting baptized at Huntington Beach. Anybody see that? Hundreds and hundreds were there getting baptized, and there was a real radical expression to it. I mean, they were coming out and shouting, and it was reminiscent of the Jesus movement. When I saw that, my heart was so gripped that I began to pray. When I saw that it was early in the morning, and on Wednesdays I have this little 30-minute program. It's called Good Morning Pastor. The Lord placed on my heart on Facebook to go live and to encourage pastors and share things that would strengthen them and ministers mostly within their call of God in the hour in which you're living. And before uh, that little program went on at 8 o'clock, I had seen that and my heart was so gripped. And I was in my study and I looked at it and I began to worship God. And as I lifted my hands and began to worship God, I saw a sea, I saw a mighty wave coming from California. I saw like a curl of a wave of refreshing washing through the nation and coming to the East Coast. I said, God, do it again. Lord, do it again. Oh, God, you apprehended the hearts of a generation. God, do it again. We believe you. We need it again. But I tell you, God filled my heart with faith to believe him for that. Worship him concerning that. How many can say, Lord, do it again? Yes. Lord, we ask for a mighty visitation in California. We ask, Lord, up and down the coast, may the beaches again be filled with awesome baptisms. Those that will forsake all and become your disciples. Those that will, Lord, commit their lives to you. Get hold of a generation. And let there be a mighty wave of the glory of God that will wash across the nation, across the plain states, into the East Coast, a tsunami of the glory of God, salvations, deliverances. Do it again, oh Lord, do it again. We believe you today and we give you praise. Hallelujah. Don't let go of the sound. Don't do it. Don't let go of the sound of what God has spoken concerning his purpose for this house and his purpose for your life. Don't let go of the prophetic sound that's been spoken over your life. Like Elijah, be focused in on God's sound. You'll see a breakthrough. Worship God as though it's done. And let me tell you, the first breakthrough that will take place is in you. Yes. There'll be a breakthrough of faith and a breakthrough of vision and a breakthrough in your spirit. How I many know that's where the greatest breakthrough is always needed? Yes. It's inside of us, a breaking in, a breaking down, that there might be a breaking forth. Yes. Give them thanks and praise. God bless you.